This is Mac Voices TV. Welcome to Mac Voices TV. This is the Talk of the Mac Community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. I'm happy to welcome back to Mac Voices TV, I believe for the first time, but certainly not to Mac Voices, Maria Langer. She is the author of the new Making Movies, A Guide for Serious Amateurs. What's especially exciting about this, folks, is that this is a Maria's Guides book. Maria, welcome. Thanks very much for having me. Wow, Maria. So <laughs> we've talked about this a little bit on Mac Voices, but uh, remind us as to what Maria's Guides are. Um, the Maria's Guides is a series of books that I have been uh, procrastinating about getting started, but <laughs> I, it actually all started with my website, which is called Maria's Guides, mariasguides.com, and on there is where you'll find articles that I write for mostly for Mac people. There's a little bit of Windows stuff on there, and most of it's related to stuff that I cover in my other books, my books for Peach Pit and um, O'Reilly. I did one for O'Reilly recently, and also my lynda.com stuff. So there's a lot of additional material on that site, and I decided to um, kind of spin that off into a series of short guides. Um, they are available in print, but it, the idea is really to get them as ebooks because they're a lot more affordable that way and more portable, and they each cover a specific topic. So um, Making Movies, A Guide for Serious Amateurs is the first one in the series, and I've got one uh, in the works now about doing aerial photography as well. So this is just not necessarily going to be a, a tech book series? You plan to branch out and maybe the next thing is a cookbook? Uh, oh, cookbook would be pretty <laughs> funny. Uh, I hope you're kind of scary, actually. No, it's, it's true, though. I, it's, um, I have a lot of personal interests. Um, I write a lot about computers because that's what the publishers pay me to write about. Um, but I have other things that I'm really interested in. I have other things that I'm... Um, I won't say an expert in, but I have a lot of experience that I can share with people, and that's what a lot of these other titles will be about. Um, making movies is based on the, my personal experiences last year when I put together a little five-minute documentary. It was a project that I'd been wanting to do for a long time, and I finally sat down and did it, and I learned a lot um, going into it after I did it, um, you know, before my research project process of it, and... Um, I put it together into a series of articles, and then the articles, I think, worked to better together in a book. So I put it, rolled it up into a book with uh, illustrations and examples. It's not a tech book because it won't tell you how to use Final Cut Pro or iMovie or how to use your camera. Um, it'll tell you about just about everything else, though, about making a little movie. Before we dig into that, I just want to make sure. So th is this the first official Maria's Guides ebook? Yes, it is. Congratulations. It is. That's great. Well, thank you. Thank that, you. That's great. And what struck me about the book, uh, and, and I'm glad you sort of explained the genesis of it, simply because I didn't feel like when I picked this up that I got a lot of iMovie or Final Cut instruction, and it yeah. wasn't necessarily designed for the, the folks who are going to shoot uh, the holiday videos and, and want to package them. This really is more about making something that you can be proud of that is a project oh, yeah. or a cause or something. It, it's um, – to me, there's – and I explain this right up in the front in the beginning of the book. There's a huge difference between shooting a bunch of video and just throwing those clips on YouTube and uh, letting people watch them. Um, you know, you can do that, and sometimes it's interesting and sometimes it's not. I've seen a lot of very boring video. It's much better if you uh, make it into a story, and that's what this the book really talks about is how you could make it into a story, brainstorming to get ideas, how you can show things, um, just how to make a, a finished product that when you're done and you could sit back and look at it and it speaks for itself and it, it, it just stands alone. And I, I think that that's really important when you're doing video, if you want people to watch it. I mean, if you don't care who watches it, then whatever. <laughs> I mean, I want people to watch it, so. So it's fair to say that if I'm making a video for my business or for whether it's home business or big business, that mm -hmm. this is the kind of thing I need to, to pick up if I really have never done video before. If you've never done video before, it's a very good starter guide because it, it, it just like I said, it again, it, it just doesn't tell you how to use your camera. It kind of assumes that you're going to learn that from someone else or that you already know it, but it tells you about 
the things you should be shooting, for example. Um, one of the examples that comes to mind is what I call the two-step, I'm um, sorry, the two-shot rule. And in the two-shot rule, it it tells you that anything that you that's important that you want to include in your video, you need to get at least two shots of it, two different angles, two different um zoom in or zoom out or just two different ways to show it at least and i tell you why and a lot of people who are doing video for the first time might not realize that they need to do this if they're showing a process for their business or they're showing something going on you know their kids soccer game is another example i use in the book um they might just think they need to show something one time but in reality when you have multiple takes of the same kind of thing of the same process or the same happening, you're more flexible when it comes to editing and how you can put it all together. And in the book goes into explain a lot of this. So even though it's really not designed to make uh, written to, with uh, business videos in mind, um, if you don't know anything about video at all and the process of putting one together, I think it gives you a lot of um, grounding and also a lot of uh, examples to kind of get your brain going so you can then think of, well, how can I apply what I've learned here to a business video and then and then take it the next step so. as, as someone who's you know f experimenting with video and trying to get more into it you're right you learn things along the way you learn mm -hmm. tr tricks and cheats one that i discovered recently and it really hasn't applied to mac voices tv but for some other things is i can take a video of you like right now and so i can have you talking for a little while and then if i cut mm -hmm. away to something else i bring you back but i've zoomed in on you so it always mm -hmm. feels like a two shot even though i'm using only yeah. the one thing i captured and you also mentioned something else there. You mentioned cutting away from me, and that's another thing that I talk about in the book. Um, right now you've got on screen one or two talking heads, depending on how you've edited this. Um, talking heads maybe in an interview might be interesting, but a talking head telling you about a specific process or about you know relating how something you know happened, um, it could get boring after 20, 30 seconds. So what I talk about is cutting away to some of the action that you that the guy is describing as an example. So your use of cutaway um, is a good example and, and cutting away to some show something, an actual thing is another example. So you could like, for example, right now you could cut away to a copy, a uh, cover copy of the book. So <laughs> if, if everything goes as expected, I will have already done that once. Oh, um, all right. Good. But, but you're absolutely right. That that's you, you you suddenly start watching TV uh, a little bit differently, uh, especially sure. the interview programs or the documentary programs, depending on what kind of video you're producing. Mm -hmm. And you, you sort of think, oh, so that's why they did that. Or, oh, I, I could use that technique. And, you know, and there's a bunch of things um, that I discovered – playing around. One of the things that I um, talk about in the book is using clips when you're in the editing process, using clips uh, differently than you shot them. And the, the perfect example, uh, and I still can't believe I pulled this off, was I needed a clip of somebody climbing, um, down, a, a uh, climbing down a ladder or I needed to clip somebody climbing up a ladder, adjusting it and then climbing up a ladder. And I didn't have that. I had somebody climbing down a ladder and adjusting it. So I was able to run the clip backwards <laughs> And because the person wasn't talking and there was no sound, you know, other than music, um, it looked as if he positioned the ladder and was climbing up. So it, little tricks like that is something that um, I think people, you just have to have the uh, little ideas that trigger these things in your brain and then your brain can take off and imagine all kinds of things like that to do. Maria, do you talk at all about stock photography? Uh, because that's something I've noticed. If I go out and shoot something, I may not have thought to shoot everything I need or just an idea may have come later, and I can go and backfill with stock photography, which is not as expensive as it used to be. It, it can mm -hmm. be pretty affordable right now. You know, in all honesty, stock photography is not one of the topics that I touched on, but you're making me think that I probably should have or at least should have mentioned it. Um, I talk a lot about uh, B-roll, shooting B-roll, where you go out and you just shoot a lot of um, whatever's going on around, you know, what the topic of the movie is. And a lot of times you can plug that that into your movie in different places. So I guess what I'm saying is almost like B-roll is your homemade stock photography in a way. Uh, but if you need to show something specific, then yeah, I think stock photography is the way to go if you can't get it yourself or if you got it and it's not just quite right or good enough. 
yeah, shooting B roll. There's there's an art to that, and and I'm still working on that because you uh-huh. think, gee, I'm shooting the most boring stuff in the world, and yet you go back later in the project, it's like, boy, am I ever glad I had that. So mm-hmm. it, it takes a while to develop an eye for things that you you might be able to use or that maybe fits your style. Yeah, I I, I agree. That's true. I just um, when I shot my project, I did a lot of B roll stuff all throughout. And it turned out that not all of it was stuff that was really B-roll. It was a lot of stuff that was um, really usable and needed, but I was shooting it thinking it would be B-roll. So. Yeah, another thing that I've discovered, and I'm curious to see if you've had that experience, is the amount that you need to shoot and leave on the cutting room floor or on yeah. the cutting room desktop, as the case may be. <laughs> you think that, well, I can just go out and I can shoot, you know, five minutes of Maria and that's what I need. And, you know, I'll, I'll tweak it a little bit, maybe add add a logo and that'll be it. And mm-hmm. you, you don't. You end up shooting a lot more. So you don't appreciate yeah. what, what real editors go through. You know, the uh, person who got me started doing video work told me that you need at least 10 times the amount of video that you – expect to finish up with so if you're doing a 10 minute video show you need 100 minutes of video um i don't think that really applies with interview type work like this but if you're doing a video about a specific topic and i had my movie was uh five minutes long my first movie was five minutes long and i shot i think a total of 40 minutes of video so it's about almost 10 times yeah, I just completed a 15-minute uh, video project for work and with with interviews with a lot of different people cutting back and forth. Mm-hmm. And it was a, a whole lot of hours uh, yeah. going back and forth, you know, asking peop- all these people the same questions, getting their reactions. And you, you might end up using 10 seconds out of, like you said, 10 minutes. Yeah. But you really needed those 10 seconds. Mm-hmm. And 10 seconds to a person, you know, listening in who really doesn't know the process too well, 10 seconds might seem like really short. But in reality, 10 seconds is a long time. So In, in video, it certainly is. In video, is. yeah. Yeah. Maria, how about sound and, uh, and, and that component of it? Because we all know that good sound can make or break a video. You know, I talk a little bit in the video about uh, doing narration because my video is narrated, um, but I also talk about dialogue and also, um, it, you know, interview footage, things like that. Again, I don't get into specifics for how to because I don't I don't want to advise them on how to use their how to set up their camera for sound, for example, or uh, the specifics of the hardware involved. Um, reasons for that, number one, is there's, there's just too many options, too many variables, and whatever I tell them today is probably not going to apply a year from now. Um, I'm very excited to have a book that might have a shelf life longer than two years, as you can imagine. <laughs> so, uh, so I don't go much into that, but I do talk about how the quality of sound is important about tricks they can use with their editing software uh for example if they've got a a background soundtrack how they can use ducking whenever they've got voices in to lower that background sound so the voices can be heard things like that i talk about another trick that you i was so glad to see you touched on it because it's a great trick and that is the use of still images whether they're Mm. stock or things that you shot uh Mm -hmm. dropping those in to create some variety and still make a point yeah I, you know, I, I didn't use that a lot in my own work, but it's definitely something that um, that can be done. And with effects like, for example, the um, Ken Burns effect, which I mentioned in the book, you can put motion into a still image. Um, it's especially effective if you've got uh, like a landscape or a scene and you zoom out or zoom in. It, you, a lot of people wouldn't even notice probably that it's not a video clip. Because if it's not a person moving or something that you could see off obvious motion, uh, just zooming in or zooming out or panning across might be enough to to make people think that it is actually video. Yeah, I like I've I've gotten to the point now. I like to watch TV. I like to watch other people's videos, see what what strikes me, what I like, what I don't, what mm-hmm. I think is effective, and then figure out how it was done and how I can incorporate it. And, yeah. and there are a million techniques out there. Yeah, def- that's definitely true. And I watch TV um, differently now as well, just looking to see what they do. And and I don't know if I think about how I would do it differently. I think it depends on what I'm watching. But I have to say one thing. When I watch uh, documentaries now and it's poorly done, it just 
jumps out at me now. And uh, five or ten years ago, maybe because I didn't pay attention as much or maybe because I didn't have as much experience or just maybe because, um, you know, computing techniques and video techniques have come so far in ten years. But ten years ago, I never would have known a bad, you know, documentary or video if you hit me in the head with it. Yeah, and and let's face it, the first couple projects you do with with anything are going to be not as good as the next few. That's part of the learning process. But if mm-hmm. you don't if you don't start, you're never going to get anywhere. It's exactly true. Maria, what um, what? And and I know this is probably not in the book, but if if I don't <laughs> ask, we will get letters. What okay. did you use to cut your movie? I use Final I use Final Cut Pro, uh, Final Cut Pro Seven. Um, it seems like uh, Overkill, I, the movie that I, that particular movie I made, I could have probably have done it just as well or almost as well with iMovie, for example. Um, but I wanted to use Final Cut Pro because it was an exercise not only in making and seeing if I could produce a little documentary, but it was also an exercise to see if I could handle the software. And uh, Final Cut Pro came through like a champ for me. It's a really, really great package. And you know, the folks that are getting into it now uh, are very lucky because it's a lot cheaper now than when I bought it. You and me both. You and me yeah. both. Have you tried the new version? No, I haven't. I'm actually kind of afraid to. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't either, but I'm I'm ready to make the leap. Yeah. Uh, it, it just seems like the future. And from from what I've been able to play with it in the demo mode, the, the time I've had to play with it in the demo mode, there are a lot of things that I'm anxious to implement that – uh, I mean, really? let's, let's face it. Final Cut Pro is a whole lot of years old, and yeah. you know now we have a lot of advantages. But if, you know, folks, if d- doesn't mean you have to go out and spend the money Maria no. and I are talking about. You've got iMovie sitting there. Start to work with it. Cut your teeth yeah. on that. It's a very, very capable program. You know, uh, I saw um, on Facebook Jeff Carlson, who writes a lot about. Um, photography and, and other topics like that for Peach Pit. Um, he got his hands on uh, iMovie on his phone, of all things, on his iPhone. And he edited a video of his family's trip to, a, uh, I guess, a farm stand or a pumpkin patch, whatever. And um, he edited this entire thing on his phone. Um, and it was remarkably good. I mean, it wasn't like professional, whatever, but it certainly fit the category of being watchable video. Um, something that you'd be proud to hand off to the grandparents or whoever. Uh, and he did all that on his phone. So I, I just think that's kind of mind blowing. I I can't imagine how he could do it with his fingers. And my fingers are too big to do that. (laughs) (laughs) Practice, practice. Yeah, I think so. Maria, how about, uh, after I've created my, my glorious video for whatever purpose, uh, any tips on distributing it or ideas about how to promote it? Um, my particular one was, again, it was mostly an experiment. Um, the projects that I have in my head that I haven't had time to put together yet will go out and they will be for sale projects. Um, for my experiment though, I just put it on YouTube. Um, I put it onto DVD, um, part, it was partially an experiment for that. I was actually very disappointed because I shot the entire movie in uh, 1080i. So it was in high, high def. Um, but I was unable to create a Blu-ray disc. Of course, I'm using a Mac, and I didn't have a Blu-ray, uh, you know, device to to uh, write it on. Um, and the resulting video was not as good as I thought it should be. Uh, and I have to say, out of everything I did on this video, I spent the most time trying to figure out how to make it better. Um, went on forums, went everywhere, talked to all kinds of experts, and everyone basically said to me, this is as good as it's going to get. You can actually do better shooting at uh, 720 uh, and then making an SD video than to shoot at um, 1080 and try to make an SD video. Uh, so that's one thing that I learned um, I would rather get the uh, Blu-ray writer, I think, and get a really good quality video. It wasn't so bad that I had to be embarrassed. and Nobody else really noticed it, but I could notice it because I, I had the original video and the original just didn't stack up to the, to the final. So it was disappointing. I'm surprised to hear you give that much attention to that, given that we all seem <laughs> to be moving away from physical media. I, I know there's still a place for it. There's probably always going to be a place for it, but it, it does seem that that is becoming less and less important for many of us. You know, it's not, not really for me because, um, I mean, right now I'm in my office. I have a really fast, great internet connection, but when I'm at home and when I'm traveling, I have really crummy access to the internet. So I'm never until 
the situation improves everywhere, uh, everywhere for me anyway. I'm never going to make the, the jump into the cloud where I won't have uh, physical media anymore or, or anything like that because I need to, um, you know, if I'm at home and I want to watch something on YouTube, my connection is so slow at home that I, I can't even get enough speed to watch a YouTube video. So what's that going to do for me for Netflix or for Hulu? It's, you know, it's not going to work. Um, the other reason in this particular project, though, that I went with a DVD is I wanted to give a copy of it uh, to the, the gentleman that owned the orchard where I shot all the video. And that turned out to kind of be a mistake because he proceeded then to ask me to make him more and more <laughs> and more. I wound up making like, uh, I think I made like 35 DVDs for him and I ran out of labels and everything. And finally, I just said to him, here's the address on YouTube. Just send people to this link. And uh, he, but he was really, really happy, but he was really proud about it. So it's always, it makes you feel good when you uh, create something that makes someone else feel good. And he was really happy about it. Yeah. And, and it's funny, video does that. Uh, it, it, it makes you feel good. It conveys things in a way that static images can't, and especially yeah. if you're trying to deliver a particular message. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's wrap this up by asking you to reveal the biggest surprise that you had, the biggest thing you learned in, in creating your video project. The biggest surprise. Yeah, the biggest, maybe the, the biggest, biggest surprise thing. was that I could do it. That yeah. was a big surprise. <laughs> That's not what I had in mind, Rhea, but I'll take it. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, that was that was actually. Um, I love when I learn something and, uh, but like learn it to death. And uh, writing the book, writing uh, the articles that led into the book was, um, I'll admit it, part of the reason I wrote it was so that I could remember what I did, um, so that if I, it, you know, six months went by before I had to do it again, I could come back, and and relearn it, you know teach basically it's teaching myself what I did so I remember oh yeah don't forget to do that step or this step or oh yeah that worked really good last time don't forget to do that or don't do this you know whatever and um that's the main reason I wrote it and it sounds funny but I uh, maybe because I'm getting older but my memory is just really bad and uh to be able to uh, write things down and remember it and then share it with other people so they can learn is really good I'm actually looking forward to getting feedback from readers. Um, I'm looking forward to getting their questions, uh, things that they think I left out that I think should be included. You know, you mentioned um, stock video. Duh, I should have. I should definitely have put that in there. Um, so that's something that might go into a next edition. But I'm looking forward to hearing from readers to see what they say and what questions I can answer on the Maria's Guide website that would go into a future edition of the book. So that's the, one of the nicest things, the coolest things to me is when you have complete control over the publishing, um, you know, I'm a writer mostly, uh, but by having complete control over the publishing, I can take notes now and whenever I feel like revising the book to add more content, to make it a, a better book or to fix something maybe that I, I said wrong, um, I could do it any time. If I discovered something right now that was mind-bogglingly stupid that I wrote, I could go in and change it right now. And it'll it'll roll out to all the future buyers. Um, if I had done that with a you know a book for one of my uh, tr traditional print publishers, you know if the book's never revised, that mistake's in there forever. And uh, you know, I don't know. I just think that kind of the readers really benefit from this from the ebook publishing in this respect. So when you mentioned the Maria's Guides website too. We, we've talked to a lot of ebook authors and a lot of traditional uh, book authors here. Mm -hmm. Everybody seems to have a presence, but there's something about the ebook experience that seems to lend itself to easier communication between author and reader, uh, whether it's for extra support or tips and tricks or, or whatever. Is, is that a, f a fair finding, you think, in your world? You know, I think it. I think that it could be, you know, I have to say this is the first, uh, a lot of my books have been out in ebook format. The books I do for Peach Bit, for example, um, my O'Reilly book for Microsoft Press, that that's also out in ebook format. Um, I don't notice any difference between my interaction with readers on those books than my print books. I don't notice it at all. Um, I think it's more of the the self-publishing or the small press publishing aspect of the ebook publishing that's really making a difference and um, making the author seem more approachable. Um, you don't have to go through this big publishing company machine to get to the author. You can go pretty much right to the author, right to the author's website. And um, there's something good about that. You know, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to bash print publishers because 
print publishing has been very good to me for a long time, and I hope it continues to be good to me for a long time. Um, but at the same time, the whole um, personal publishing revolution, including ebooks and print on demand and, and other aspects of it, um, they've just opened up um, uh, authors serious authors, knowledgeable authors, um, to share more with an audience beyond what um, a print publisher would do. This particular book, I, I wouldn't be able to get a print publisher to do this for me because they they need to sell X thousand copies in order to make the project worthwhile. Um, I don't need to sell X thousand copies. So whatever. Yeah, I, and I don't think it's bashing. I think it's just another part of the discussion we're having about the evolution of publishing and, and what yeah. publishing really means. Uh, you're right. There's uh, well, you brought up a great point uh, as far as video distribution, but there's still mm -hmm. a lot of places that don't have the connectivity to deliver this stuff online. So it's true. You're going to have to have some of the physical distribution, and the same mm -hmm. thing with the print publisher. There's still plenty of advantages to having a book. There are also some disadvantages. So mm -hmm. you know, it it cuts both ways. Yeah. Maria, while you're not making movies and while you're not flying <laughs> helicopters, I, I know you've been doing a few other things. You have your hands in a lot of different projects. What are some of the other things uh, that you've been up to since the last time we talked? Well, the most, uh, let's see, going back through the summer, I had, I think last time we talked, I was just finishing up recording a video for lynda.com about Twitter. And that came out in uh, June. So that's refreshed in June. And uh, they're talking about the possibility of refreshing it again in the spring. Um, one cr really cool thing about Linda, uh, lynda.com, which I really can't stress enough, is that in a course like the Twitter course um, or any other course that they have, once you become a lynda.com subscriber, you can take any course you like. You can take it as many times as you like. If it's revised or refreshed or whatever, you can take the new material or get brushed up at any time. And it doesn't cost you any more than the first time. So that's that's a really good feature. Um, so we did the uh, Twitter course. Uh, I also was in the process of writing a book about uh, Mac OS X Lion, and that book came out in July. Uh, I think it was in the ebook version was out the same day as the software. I think the book was about an hour, a uh, week, a week after that. Um, and then I'm working on. I just finished a book uh, also for Peach Pit Press about Dragon Dictate, and I believe this is the only book out about it, and that should be out. Um, I'm thinking within a week or two. Oh, so that's, that's great. That that's an exciting yeah. topic right there. That takes us in a whole other direction. The voice recognition features of Dragon Dictate are absolutely mind-bogglingly amazing. This program understands almost. If I had it turned on right now and it was transcribing this, it would transcribe my voice almost perfectly. Even all my stutters, it would get them all. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, it's a really cool program, and I'm looking forward to working on a, a book where I sit back in my chair and I let Dragon Dictate do all the typing for me. So we'll see if that happens. I hope that doesn't replace any of the interviews here. No. 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 I can't imagine that. No, because this is way too much fun. Yeah. We, we can't give this up. Nope. Okay, so give us the websites and everything where people need to go to pick up this, or I, I guess I should ask, is it just available, uh, is it in, available in, in the iBook store or the Kindle book store or where? Okay, it's right now available in definitely two places, maybe by the time this comes out, a third place. It's a, in the Kindle store, so you can get it as a Kindle book. Um, there's slight problems with the formatting, and I'm tr trying to... Um, um, troubleshoot that. It's, it doesn't affect the whole book. It only affects, I think, two places. The bullets are somehow screwed up. So I'm hoping to get that fixed. But in the meantime, um, it's there. And um, it's also available through MagCloud, M-A-G-C-L-O-U-D, MagCloud.com. MagCloud is a really funky um, print-on-demand publisher. It is operated by HP, the printer people. And it's designed primarily for magazines, but they had a new format that just came out, which is a smaller um, half-page booklet-type format. And I created the book to, to fit into that format, and it comes out to 64 pages in that format. Um, so this is a, an avenue for people to get the printed book if you want a printed copy of the book, um, which, of course, is more a little bit more costly than the e-book the e version. Um, the other thing that MagCloud also offers is they've got a free iBook, um, no, an iPad app, a free iPad app, and uh, you can download the book into that iPad app. 
Um, and it also should be in the iTunes uh, iBook store shortly. Um, it was submitted last week, but they are not very swift about getting it out. <laughs> but it's coming. It's but coming. I did watch my language, so it should get in there. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So so it's it's coming. That's the, oh, yeah. that's the best part. And of course, it's mariasguides.com to mm-hmm. be able to come and communicate with you directly about this topic or any of the other things that are there. I know you've been doing a lot of revamping to all your websites. I just completely it's um like 95% done, completely reworked uh, mariasguides.com from the ground up. I went through um I deleted a lot of really old stuff that really was no use to anybody uh to kind of slim up the site a little bit and I reorganized it by topic. I just need to do a few more interface changes to make certain topics easier to find and then it's going to be um I, then it'll be done, but it's perfectly uh, usable now, and uh, I'm trying to add more content to it. I'm trying to put like at least two small articles a week on there, uh, plus any information about the new books coming out. So that's very cool. That's very mm. cool. Thanks. Well, thanks so much for talking to us about this. Uh, I'm I'm excited to spend a little more quality time with the book and maybe learn some things <laughs> that I haven't discovered and and get some ideas because we're and- all always looking for those. And just send me your feedback. If uh, like the um, stock photography or stock video, um, that's really a good point. And that's something that the kinds of feedback I'm interested in to make it better. Great. Great. We'll talk to you again soon after uh, the next project, whatever that is. (laughs) All right. Folks, that's Maria Langer. She is the author of Making Movies, A Guide for Serious Amateurs. Uh, It is from Maria's Guides at mariasguides.com. Until the next time. Making movies is the talk of the Mac community. I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices TV. Thanks for watching. Mac Voices TV is part of the Mac Voices Group and a member of Mac Level 10. 